from Key Auto Group Complex here in Durham, New Hampshire. Hard to believe, but it's the regular season finale in Hockey East as the number 18 New Hampshire Wildcats host the UMass Mo River Hawks in the Granite State. Welcome inside the Whittemore Center, everybody, with Jim Connolly. I'm Tyler Murray. We'll check in with Natalie Nori in just a moment. Game two of a home-and-home -home weekend series. UNH wins on the road 4-0 yesterday. There's a chance we could see this matchup again in the playoffs on Wednesday, but right now, Jim, all about just finishing strong for these two teams. It certainly is. In UNH, they know they're going to be the sixth seed. They know they'll be at home on Wednesday. They, they want to still put a really good effort forward particularly the, knowing they could face the Riverhawks again. For Lowell, though, they want a better effort. Last night was almost a lost game for them, one you have to kind of throw out, try to reset their things. We'll see what senior captain Ben Mean can do to start turning the tide for the Riverhawks tonight. You know, the senior captain for the Riverhawks, he's had a difficult final season, missing a large chunk of time, having undergone menis meniscus surgery. But this is a player who plays with heart, and as the senior season heads toward a conclusion, look for that heart to show in his play. On the other side, for UNH, Harrison Blaisdell on Friday. He was beaming when Natalie interviewed him, having just posted his first two-goal game as a collegian. The senior winger has worked himself into every situation, according to Coach Mike Souza. PK, second power play unit. His versatility is his biggest asset. UNH, they were picked to finish 10th in hockey this season with some earlier results today they're locked into the sixth seed see if they can put a bow on a really impressive season next just about ready for puck drop here at the Whittemore Center but first let's send it down ringside with Natalie Norrie well, thank you, Tyler. You and Jim said it. It is the regular season finale tonight. UNH with that 4 nothing win over the River Hawks last night, but it is all about closing this series out on a high note, especially heading into playoffs. Now, after the game last night, River Hawk head coach Norm Bazin unhappy with the way that his team played. He said, not the game we were looking for, not the kind of game that we're accustomed to playing, especially in our D zone. And he said, we weren't threatening enough in the O zone. He said, coming into this one tonight, we need to bring the energy that he thought his team lacked last night. Now, Wildcat head coach Mike Souza happy with his team's performance, saying it was great to see the team have a quick start. The forecheck asserted itself well at times, and they didn't give up a ton of shots. But he said the real difference maker, Jakob Helston, who recorded his third shutout in net. All three of his career shutouts coming here at UNH. Coach Souza said he was outstanding. It sure was. Thanks, Natalie. And I think goaltending, Jim, is the headline story of this game for UMass Lowell because after Henry Wells was pulled yesterday following uh, four goals allowed on 13 shots, Luke Pavisic came in, stopped all nine shots he faced, and he gets the finale start for the regular season. Yeah, it's interesting. You usually want to set a kind of a tone going into the playoffs, and that might be telling you tipping Norm Bazin's hand a little bit. Looked like he might have had a hand pass right off that opening draw, but the officials let it go. But that can kind of tip a, tip a hand a little bit. And maybe that's who starts in, in Wednesday's quarterfinal game. But regardless, obviously, Norm Bay's in second straight Saturday, giving the start to Pavisic. He he's, has faith in his goalie. A tough early save made from Jakob Helston. Staying in net, the North Dakota transfer. And the 21 save shutout yesterday. Tyler Muslik, he's a... Healthy enough to play, it would seem, but Turner on the move and an early save for Pavisic covering up the rebound. Just 40 seconds in, and this is no surprise. Last night, things got a little sloppy. And now it's getting chippy extremely early on in the final game of the year. Yeah, something that I will say that we've seen toward the end of the season, we'll look at this uh, uh, rush up ice for UNH. Uh, Brian Murphy, the head of officials for Hockey East, has been most weekends putting the same crews together back-to-back -to -back nights. The reason I think he does that is so that you understand the tone from game one, you understand the emotions, and on, on night two, you're usually in better control as an officiating crew. So we have those same two referees, Bobby and Esposito, Peter Slichtenhart, here at night. There were a few uh, offsetting minors late in last night's game. Uh, Cross check on Liam Devlin. Wasn't well received by UMass Lowell. It came in front of the benches. Isaac Johnson pushes it out of his own end and batted back down towards Scout Truman. There's Jack Farwork at two goals last Saturday in 65 seconds against UMass. Ben Meehan now, senior Riverhawk captain. That one hit off of Christoph Scrastens. Matt Krasa 
checked into the corner. And Marty Lavins comes back to get it. Last weekend, UMass Lowell lost twice in overtime to UMass, one at home and one on the road. And it was UNH as well that played exceptionally but didn't come away with any points against Boston College last week. And that one got through and then back between the legs of Helston. Meanwhile, at center ice, Jack Barworth's helmet came off, so they blow the play dead. It's also a shattered stick in the Wildcats. This is already visible. Yes. I guess we're not surprised. When I had talked about it a little bit in the third period and last night, obviously these two teams back to back consecutive games as you see that hit finished off there on bar work, dislodged his helmet. It was Marty Lavins with the hit. You know, we, as we, we kind of highlighted in the open, there's a good chance these, these two teams could meet for the third time in five days on Wednesday in the Hockey East quarter, quarterfinals. And you, know, you talk about emotions that will start to ride high, and when you play three straight games in that short of a period of time, it's just not something you do uh, in college hockey. You don't even do it in the NHL unless you're in the in the postseason so it's it's something very strange and something that I think you know, the emotions become a big part of the game. And Wednesday will be hosted here. UNH will be the sixth seed. The only question is who will they play these River Hawks or the Merrimack Warriors. If UMass Lowell wins in regulation and Merrimack doesn't get any points against Boston College they're playing them at home tonight. Then UMass Lowell would tie for 10th, and they do have the tiebreaker, so if they can get out of the bottom spot and avoid playing three straight games and two in a row here at the win. But it's all order, especially after how dominant the Wildcats were yesterday on the road. Throws Collins in the corner, jammed it through the middle, and Peterson couldn't do much with it. Not a clean breakout that time for UNH, but here they come anyway. Sardarian and Reed hop in there, thrown across, but it's out of ring's reach. That fourth line really started the action yesterday for UNH. It was Caffarelli and Ring connecting for the game's first goal. And there goes Caffarelli again for the corner. A hard hit from Brandon Ingham. For his senior day yesterday at UMass Lowell. It's Alex Gagney, the junior captain. Gagney down low. Around for Caffarelli. He's got Ring in the middle. They keep it Behind the cage with Gagney, centers for Sardarian, rings the post, it stayed out, and here comes Bentley the other way. That was one of those posts that's right on the inside of the joint of the post and the crossbar. Hard to keep out when you hit at that angle, but came almost straight back into the slot that one was hit so hard. I think half the fans in the building thought that snuck in. As that one lands in front of Cronin, means the first two at them. Last night, eight of the game's first nine shots belonged to UNH, including the goal from Nick Caffarelli. The touch pass to Jack Farwork plays. Dell closes out quickly, though, and it frees up Cronin the other way. Slided ahead towards Cam Gendron. Getting on the ice for his senior night. Ninth game of the year for the senior from Hampstead, New Hampshire. Those they have to be separated once again. Get another look at that opportunity into the slot. And look where this one hits. Right off the, uh, that's a, it ends up hitting the left post, I think, entirely. Well, boy, crossbar post, I don't know, I can't decide. I've watched two <laughs> replays, I watched it live. That is as as solid of a, a shot. And it's so much so that the referees are actually, I believe, in there looking to make sure that that puck didn't, uh, didn't cross the goal line. I think it's worth a look, but of course. I think we have our answer. Real quick. No goal. Yeah, real quick. That's all you can ask for, a quick and correct call from Bobby Esposito and Peter Schlittenhardt. So Cronin and Varwerk set to take this face off just outside the Riverhawk line. You know UMass Lowell, after how sluggish they were to start yesterday's game, really wants to have a jolt early on. Maybe they can build something off of the near escape. And it banged off the post. Truman tried to speed past Lindner, but it slung ahead. Blaisdell gave it up, though. It's Truman's puck again before Lindner took it off him. You can actually already see that the Riverhawks have their, their legs under them much more than they did last night. Gendron slipping around Angham, and it's pushed wide by Cronin. Blaisdell down low off the inboards for Cronin. Angham forces it free. Our work ambushed by Strastins, and forced down deep by UNH. No spring break here this week for Wildcats students, so a well-attended student section as always here at the Wit. 
I mean, it's one of those fan bases that always seems to show up, but this is going to wind up being their first winning season since 2014. They've had a couple of 500 seasons during this stretch, but just a positive response from the local fans and, of course, the students has been well deserved for Mike Sousa's team. And, you know, for good reason. And we've seen the, you and I were here all the way back on opening night, a, a win over number one BU at the time. And that student section was banged out for, for UNH. And all season we've seen them turn out really well in this building. Shot went wide, so Luke Reed is there. And it's Marty Lavins on the other end. Lavins stays center ice, dumps it in, throws a check on Jake Stella. He's become a fan favorite very early in his UNH career, the freshman from Latvia. You can almost see that UNH is putting an emphasis on delivering some, some hits here early. They want to set a little bit of a physical Hi, tone. Hi. Johnson, high-powered pairing on the blue line for Norm Bazin. Stick lips for Collins to keep it away from Jensen. And Peterson, the Holy Cross transfer, stonewalled by Conby. Comes loose to the circle, though. Collins reaching for it. And a good grab by Johnson to keep it in momentarily. But Devlin and that top UNH line are free. And clear with LeClaire. Off to back to Gagney. Turn back from Peterson to post up along the half wall. Hero kept it in. Zips one to LeClaire, and he's turned away by Pavisic. Good look for that top line inside LeClaire. Assist last night to a 26-point sophomore season following up a 20-point freshman campaign. Yeah, this is a really good move. You keep, keep in there at the blue line, and then right over to arguably your best shooter in LeClaire, and he gets a great shot off. Had to gather in a little bit. You, that's one you, you're not going to one time that most times, but gathers it in, still gets a fantastic shot off, and Pavisic had to really make sure he had the post. That was a clean faceoff win for Nick Ring, but maybe a little too clean. It's a warning, and they'll drop it again. Tough to beat Dylan Bentley without at least some sort of tie up. More like it. Sardarian comes out of the pack and rifles one high. One came back to ring. Dropped it for Hewitt straight away. Shot from distance. Popped wide just over the crossbar. Now Rayon. Jumped by Sardarian. Threw it on. Up high and a reaching Pavisic maybe got a piece of it. Almost a giveaway there. Caffarelli couldn't get the stick down. But it'll come to Sardarian on the other end. He was the one who banged one off the post a few moments ago. For the review, they said no goal. Linder's shot was angled up high over the glass and out of play to send us to our first timeout. 13 28 to go. The UNH cruised to a 4 0 win on the road yesterday, but Pavisic and the Riverhawks hang it tough early in the regular season finale. Bittersweet night here at the Whittemore Center as this year's senior class was honored pregame with a senior night celebration. Now, I have to say that this is the class that was the last class I went to school with here at UNH. So that only means that I'm getting older too, Tyler and Jim. But Coach Souza reflected on this group saying that these were the ones that went through COVID. All the kids were locked up in a dorm during quarantine. Coach Souza and the head of hockey ops, Colin Shank hand delivered their meals at the time they were thinking these poor kids but they stuck with it and coach Souza said one of the best parts of this job is seeing young men turn into men it makes coaching so much fun and this particular class has grown so much they're really good kids tireless workers and great people so he's enjoyed seeing their growth and nice for them to be honored with their families here and I do want to shout out Natalie, too. We were working here at UNH a few years ago when she was still a student. And True. not just an on-camera, that one is fired wide, not just an on-camera personality, but she was behind the scenes working replays, running cameras sometimes. So uh, Natalie Nori is uh, maybe celebrating her own kind of a senior day celebration. But I did like what Mike Souza said as well about just how rewarding it is to see guys develop. I think he told the story of someone he coached five years ago needing a job recommendation or just advice on the job market and we're turning to him first and he seems like the kind of guy that a lot of guys really confide in when they're uh, done with their playing careers too you spend so much time with your head coach over the course of four years you get so close typically and you know that's a relationship you build and, and you usually keep it for a long time and, you know same thing with classmates and we know but you know, pro hockey, you're not, you're not really guaranteed. And I know in the age of the transfer portal, you're not always guaranteed four years anyway uh, in college these days. But, you know, when you do stay and you graduate, the, the relationships are just so strong. 
Marty Lavins is in as Scraston stayed on side. Got all the way through to Pavisic who made a pad save. Engham clears the rebound. And Barwork will lob this one to center. I mentioned earlier I thought that Lowell's legs looked better than last night. Well, listen, UNH has matched and maybe exceeded that. They are really starting to get the pressure on 6 0 shot on goal lead right now uh, for the Wildcats in this game. Well, a lot of new faces on the ice that didn't play yesterday. Kurt Silkons is out there right now. Matt Krasa, Adam Cardona, Peterson with a toe drag. Didn't get there. Silkons looking to keep it alive. We'll take a bump from Lavins. They get it out to Cooper and now Becker. Nice stick work to get to the circle. And it's blocked by Lavins again. Stick down by Elston off of the Peterson shot. Cooper off glass and around to Collins. Back to Becker. Sidestep Brian Conby. Becker with some real estate and a save from Helston. Nice footwork from Mitchell Becker from his blue line position to get a good look, but Helston still has not given up a goal all weekend. No, I mean, he's looked very solid and positionally sound, but you know, this is what Lowell needs to do. They've got to find some zone possession time. I thought that it was so limited, you know, maybe late in the game once they had already dug a four goal hole. They, they started to, to get some better zone time, but they've got to find that early in this game. They've got to start trying to actually push the pace, play their game instead of really having to adjust to what UNH is doing. Claire bumped by Ray Ohm, and then he takes down Heward, and the arm goes up for a penalty. A power play will come for UNH. They're trying to get Helston off for a six on five sequence, and they do. Good skill guys on the ice as well with the Sardarian lead in the way. He's got Conby and Linder on his left with Devlin at the bottom of the screen. Tipped out to LeClaire. Six on five empty net delayed penalty against UMass Lowell. It's hard off of Lindner skates off the Hewitt pass and that will set up the power play with 10.43 to go in the first period. And neither team successful on the power play yesterday each 0 for 4. Nick Rayum will be tripping as the call as he heads to the box here in the corner here. Just get, you know, stick gets tangled up. It's it's one of those plays you, you get angry probably when you take the penalty, but you realize your stick is in between the legs. Player skates over it. It's always going to be called. It's the 16th penalty of the season for Nick Rayum. That is a team high. Winters will push it along. Fitzgerald out to the blue line. Reed now to the circle. Straston walks away from Angham. And Fitzgerald near the wall. Turns it down deep for Harrison. Plays down. Winters got it to Reed. And now it's Fitzgerald again. Straston to Blaisdell. Popped off his stick. Comes around to Schweigert. And he's got a clean lane to clear. This was a bit of some of the struggle times last night just penetrating this low penalty kill. They do a nice job of keeping you away from the net, keeping you on the outside. Here they come on the power play. Sardarian couldn't get a stick down. Fitzgerald over halfway through period one. 51 seconds into the opening power play chance. Reed. Out of the circles. Crested with a drive. Rebound kept out. Centering feet never came across to Blaisdell. Another chance in the middle, ring fanned on it, and Pavicic is there to cover up with 9.37 to go. We'd like to welcome in a new audience. Most of you tuned in to Red Sox Spring Training Baseball in the Dominican. Welcome aboard. It's the Hockey East Game of the Week, UNH and UMass Lowell. Some good shots here on the UNH power play. Well, that was a big issue that Mike Souza talked about coming into this weekend, needing to find ways to penetrate that first layer. You have to get the puck through. You can't get shots blocked. And you know, the power play has done a really good job of moving the puck of late, but not scoring. And a lot of that is getting through. You saw that opportunity there. They get that puck in the slot, just couldn't convert. Sardarian finds the loose puck, and he scores! On the power play! Big time snipe from Steven Sardarian. One nothing, New Hampshire.
almost feels like Steven Sardarian heard me. He takes the puck to the net. What a shot here. I mean, that is just an unbelievable shot. As soon as Pavisic drops to his knees, he's able to put that one right under the crossbar. That's a skill play right there for Steven Sardarian. Sixth goal of the season for Hammond. The power play drought is now over for UNH. Yes, they were 0 for their last 18 despite getting a lot of good looks. The coaching staff was encouraged, but never more encouraged than right there. Phenomenal finish from Steven Sardarian, his sixth of the season. Third rounder of the Sabres. Now Caffarelli couldn't double the lead as that rolled off his stick a bit in front of a sprawling Pavison. This is how it happened yesterday. They got one, then they got another quickly. And it happened again early in the second. And before he knew it, it was 4 nothing UNH, and that would be the final score. Jensen to the middle. And no chance for Gendron to square up. This is, I feel like this UNH team has done a great job this season finding and maintaining momentum. They're really, really good. And they've actually also had some good responses to other teams' momentum shifts. And that is one of those things going into the playoffs. You want to find ways to maybe make things go lights out when you start getting momentum on your side. Turnover forced by Caffarelli. What can they do with it? Bounced wide, a ring behind the net. And now Reed rifled that one wide with a whist. Or it comes out to Fitzgerald. Now Reed. the goal unassisted at the moment for Sardarian as Cooper got turned down by Crone in one timer and it's blocked. Blaisdell was denied. It's Gerald with a rip. That one turned back by Cooper. All in possession here after the goal for UNH. Cronin down low. Off the side of Pavisic, swept up and out by UMass Lowell. And if you're just joining us, this could be a first round Hockey East playoff preview. Wednesday is round one. UNH is locked into the sixth seed. They will host whoever gets the 11th seed. And because this is the last game of the regular season, UMass Lowell needs a regulation win. And then a Merrimack loss to move up to the 10th spot and avoid playing at UNH again. Looks like we're going to get too many men in the ice penalty here. Penalty box door opens up. 7.24 to go and a power play next on Nessim. Feels like another packed house tonight at the Whittemore Center. And again, Wednesday could be a playoff matchup between these two teams, but we know it's going to be UNH, and you can only imagine how loud this place is going to be when they host their first playoff game since 2015. That was the last time they went to TD Garden. Knocked out of the semifinals by eventual Hockey East champion and national runner-up Boston University. UNH coming off that power play goal. They're going to go right back to the power play as Lowell was called for too many men on the ice. Saw so one of those penalties early yesterday as well. They're piling up in the early going. It was a four on three power play at one point for you. Top power play unit is out there. It's Heward, the Sardarian. Touch pass out to LeClaire. How about a one-timer from Conby? But he didn't get all of it. Yeah, just a little bit of a misfire. That's where you want to move that puck. Get it over to that left elbow. But Conby just couldn't get the wood on it he wanted. 30-point season for Ryan Conby after goal number 14 yesterday. Colton Heward works his way to the corner. And around for LeClaire. Comes to Conby. Chips it over to Sardarian. Bean will whack it around. LeClaire tried to keep it in. And Conby did. I think toward the middle. And Cup Devlin on that pass, but he'll keep it in front of the blue line. You were down to give it up. Stella will turn it down the ice. So 30 points in a freshman year for Ryan Conby. That is the most by a freshman UNH Wildcat since James Van Riemsdyk had 34 points back in 07 08. He's in that kind of company. So that's really good company. <laughs> I bad. mean, what, what happened to that guy? <laughs> <laughs> of course, he's got a 38 point season with the Boston Bruins this year. Year one back in New England. 
That one rolls off the stick of a spinning Fitzgerald. And they'll call it offside with 23 seconds left on the power play. Of course, it's 1 0 UNH on a power play goal from Steven Sardari. UNH might have gotten away with one right there in the neutral zone. As they were coming in, yes, they were offside, but before that, a couple of pucks almost turned over. And if they had, they had Scout Truman, UMass Lowell had Scout Truman looking to go the other way. Off win for Matt Kraza on the PK. Into the corner wall, Winters would slow it up, so Kraza will skate it ahead. Blaisdell lost his stick, and then Kraza lost the puck. That'll roll ahead to Luke Reed. Feathers one through for Blaisdell. Dropped it to ring. Angles toward the circle. Didn't have a lane, and he's ridden into the boards by Johnson. Penalty is over. Back to five on five, but Shot totals now heavily favoring UNH 10 to 3, similar to what we saw yesterday, despite what feels like a renewed effort from the Riverhawks. It's just been a, a Wildcat weekend so far. Jensen off the board, but Scrastons couldn't handle it. Rayom looking for it. It winds up with Scrastons again. Meehan has it now, and over to Becker. But Scrastons behind, and Becker goes all the way in. Gagney behind, bumped by Owens. Now Collins into the corner boards. Gendron is forced back down low. Owens took a heavy hit from Gagne. Like Susa was talking this week, how rare it is in the history of UNH to have a junior captain, of course, usually reserved for a senior or grad student, but Alex Gagne, really since he got here two years ago as a freshman, has embodied the, the kind of hockey they want to play here. They're on and off the ice, too. You know. Sousa talks a lot about his work ethic, because he gets to the brink early every day. But then on the ice, his game has really grown this season. Offensively, he's able to chip in a little bit more of late. And his defensive effort, I mean, he might be, you know, he probably could be, you know, top defensive defenseman in Hockey East. He, that's the type of season he's had. Partly because Hunter McDonald, last year's winner, missed uh, almost the entire first half with an injury, but he's been great for Northeastern since coming back after the holiday break. Here's Scout Truman from the corner. Shot was blocked by Heward this time. That's off the skates of Cardona, and Leclerc takes advantage. Here's Conby and Devlin on the near side. Conby gets it to Devlin, and a big save from Pavistich. Came right back out in front, but it lands with Truman, and he gets it to neutral. That's a great look across that the ability to see that pass Pavisic really had to move hard to his right and stay as square as he possibly could use those big big broad shoulders to deflect that puck Elston gets it around Cole forced it back down approaching the final three minutes of period one power play goal from Steven Sardarian his second power play score of the season Varwork reaching for it. Arm goes up for a UNH penalty. Varwork shot was blocked. Pavisic sprints to the bench. Stella coming on for the six on five, but he'll head right back as UNH touches up. They've had two power plays so far. They've scored on one of them. It'll be the first Riverhawk power play when we come back to Durham, New Hampshire. It is Brendan Fitzgerald into the penalty box. First penalty of the day for UNH. Yeah, gets the stick up into the hands there on Cole, actually into the arms as well. So the UMass Lowell power play needing a goal here to pull momentum back in their favor. 11-3 shots in favor of UNH right now. A good weekend so far for Fitzgerald. Plenty of time on the puck yesterday. Had an assist of five points in his freshman campaign. That save there from Helston on the one-timer by Fornas Svensson. Against Stella, Fornas Svensson, Bentley, Meehan, and Johnson on the ice for this power play. UNH penalty kill. Right now it's led by Scrastons out high with Gagney making a nice play to sweep it out. And they've got Blaisdell and Lavins back in the UNH end right now. Good pass to get Stella some room on the near side wing. Dropped it to Kraza. Jammed it across to Ben Mee, and it'll go for a spin. No shooting lane with a good closeout from Lavins. The circle for Krasa. Shot was knocked down by Scrastens. 
Into the corner they go, and it's chipped down the ice. Two minutes left in period one. Despite the fact that UNH hasn't had to play a lot of defense tonight, they already have five. They already have five block shots in this game, so that's something to keep an eye on. They did a great job last weekend against Boston College as well, blocking just a ton of shots. Yeah, tough to beat in this building, especially 12, 4, and 1 at home. Their most home wins since 2009. Schweiger skips it over the stick of Truman, but he played it off the boards anyway. Back to Schweiger. Touch pass down low. Room for Cole. Tries the net, but pushed it wide. Set up from Owen Cole. Started the second half with seven goals in his first 10 games, but hasn't scored since then. Season for UMass Lowell that started strong. They won four of their first six games, but they've won just four cents, and a lot of that has had to do with the injury bug. They're as healthy now as they have been since the fall. It's a matter of getting right before the postseason, and yesterday was a bit of a disappointing effort after back to back overtime games against UMass. Had a lot of people encouraged about what the home stretch would look like. And they're down 4 nothing early on in the second period and that wound up being the final score as Helston covers up to get the whistle. Yeah, and, you know you can tell the health of the Riverhawks when you just look at the lineup over the two nights the number of jerseys that have switched out the number of new players in the lineup tonight for the Riverhawks to have that this time of year always a luxury for a coach you know it's coaches will tell you injuries are awful but you want to have the least amount of injuries uh, at least in college hockey around the month of March. Collins gets a warning on that face off. They'll drop it again with Cronin. Seven thirty puck drop tonight. A little bit later than usual. They had to uh, play off basketball across the street at Lundholm Gymnasium. UNH beat Binghamton. Four or five quarterfinal matchup. We're going to go to the dynastic Vermont Catamounts in Burlington on Tuesday. But exciting times around here in Durham, New Hampshire. As Collins sets up down low. And UMass Lowell's basketball team also won a quarterfinal game today, so they move on to the seven. For overtime for the Riverhawks. That that was one to uh, to sweat out for <laughs> for the number two seed Riverhawk team. The bouncer on Pavisic will close the pads. Engen will track it down. There's enough time for Nick Rayom to bring it up ice. Jump by Cronin, skips one in, and that'll wind out the clock on period one. So much like yesterday, a well-managed first period from New Hampshire. They'll take the lead into the locker room. It was 2 nothing at this point yesterday, but one nothing for the team that will host a first-round playoff game as the sixth seed here on Wednesday. You know, I think that was a pretty good period there for the Wildcats yet again. I thought that Lowell had more jump than they did maybe uh, a night ago, but, you know, UNH had the push, and they really had some really good legs. Just to watch them skate and to the way they're moving up ice this whole weekend, uh, they certainly are playing their best hockey right now. Steven Sardarian, who scored a power play goal, is standing by with Natalie. Steven, you made a beautiful play. Looked like you lined it up nicely. Talk to us about your goal. This, it was power play. It was good battle. I don't know what I say. Just good battle, good goal for our power play, power play. Now your team has an early lead again. How do you want to see them come out and play in the second period? We have to play hard, and uh, I think we just have to keep going and. I think everything is going to be good, I think. Uh, we have Wednesday, Wednesday game, maybe against this team, and we have to play hard. That's it. All right, Steven, thank you so much. Yeah, good luck. Back to you, Tyler. Legitimately excellent stuff there. Thank you, Natalie. one nothing UNH with the lead after one. Steven Sardarian, the Buffalo Sabres third round draft pick out of St. Petersburg, Russia, has the difference making goal right now.
get the ice ready for period two. About six and a half minutes until we drop the puck for the middle frame. Right now, it's one nothing New Hampshire. Final game of the regular season, and it could be a first-round playoff preview. With Jim Connolly, Natalie Nori, I'm Tyler Murray. Jimmy, how about some first-period highlights? I'll tell you, you know, at least early on, the story of this the first period was how physical it was. We, we've mentioned it. You know, these teams have played back-to-back -back nights here in a, you know, a series that is certainly going to get emotional, especially knowing that a pretty good chance that these two teams could meet again in Wednesday in the, in the Hockey East opening round of the playoffs. As we look at St Stephen Sartari, and he snipes one off the crossbar there. Um, you know, I thought the UNH offense, just like last night, got things going. Their skating legs have been fantastic this entire weekend. Uh, that's something that I think Mike Souza has to be really happy with. Here's the goal. This is the power play goal. Look at the play that Sardarian makes along the board. You have Swigart on his back, backhand. Sardarian reads that, takes the puck in the knee, and then just goes with it. It goes right to the net with it. Perfect shot up high. Fish on the ice. And that's where we are through one period of one nothing lead for UNH. Taking a look at the statistics. A good face-off night so far for UMass Lowell. You, you had some standouts for UNH yesterday, like Cy LeClaire was 9 out of 13, so a good bounce back from the Riverhawks in that department. But again, they're looking up at the Wildcats after one. Yeah, they are, and, you know, and I, I noticed the block shot total, 6 for UNH. Lowell didn't play, spend enough time in their, their zone to probably get six shots blocked. They've got to try to find some shooting lanes, change your angles, make the pass, shoot off the pass quicker, whatever it might be, they've got to find ways to get through some of those lanes. The UNH could host Lowell on Wednesday. They could host Merrimack here on Wednesday. Meanwhile, UMass and Maine, they're playing a big game too. We'll check around the league in just a bit. One at nothing at UNH. Two periods to go in the regular season in 23-24. for puck drop here in period two. Take a look at the Hockey East standing. This is updated after a shootout win for Providence over Northeastern and a regulation win for BU over Vermont. Seeds one, two, and three are locked in. BC, BU, and Maine. Same story for seeds six, seven, eight, and nine. And that means right now, UMass, who was tied three to three with Maine late in the second period, and they're playing for the opportunity to host Providence in that 4-5 quarterfinal matchup. Because Providence got two points today, UMass has the tiebreaker, so they need an overtime win, a shootout win, or a regulation win, and then they get the four. But of course, they're on the road in Maine, and that's a, a tough place to win. Yeah, it certainly is. And last night's game, last night's game came down to late moments in that game, a 2-1 win for the Black Bears. Before we drop the puck, let's send it back down to our ringside reporter. It's Natalie North. Thanks, Tyler. Yep, during that intermission, we just got up with Lowell Associate Head Coach Andy Vischetto, and he said tonight's start is a lot better than last night's. He said we've slowed them down in transition. We had a bit of a good ozone presence during that period, but we just need to make sure that we keep attacking. He said from the UNH defense, we see that they stay pretty compact in their zone, so we just need to spread them out more, get inside, and wait for them to break out, really try to slow them down in that sense. And the, uh, the goaltending intrigue continues, Jim. It's still Luke Pavicic in net for UMass Lowell. And Mike Souza, I think every coach is happy to not have to make tough decisions like that. He knows Jakob Helston has been his guy the entire second half for the most part. And it feels like uh, no question we'll see him again on Wednesday. Yeah, you know, I mean, he's, he's the workhorse right now for this Wildcats team. He's playing great. Obviously, hasn't allowed a goal thus far this weekend in 80 minutes of work. River Hawks in red, white, and blue. It's the home whites for UNH. And it's a Wildcat team that was picked 10th out of 11 in the preseason poll in Hockey East this year. And following the uh, Providence shootout win today at home over Northeastern, they are now locked in at six. So a huge step forward in the Mike Souza era. Great recruiting class. Impressive leadership and you know, all the seniors that were honored today as we have an icing call. And Mike Susan noted this week that they would not know everybody's plans, but every senior still does have an extra year of eligibility if they choose to come back if there's room for them next year. Yeah, that's one of the 
questions every program has. You know, you, you do a lot of recruiting two, three plus years down the road. And so you have to make sure when you're in that type of a situation that, as you said, you've got to be able to find room for that player on your team. You know, and, and does that require a scholarship? Does that, you know, how do you how do you make room? You can carry as many players as you want, but how many players want at least partial scholarship and, and don't want to pay their way for that fifth year? River Hawks still searching for their first goal of the weekend. 4 nothing win for UNH at the Sanga Center last night. Ryan Conby had one of those four goals. Here he comes into the offensive end with LeClaire and Devlin. Conby throws it to the middle. LeClaire over to Devlin. He scores! Oh, the top line delivers again. It's 2 nothing UNH. To back nights with quick starts to the period here middle frame for UNH this one ends up looked like it was an attempted shot but it ends up just off a skate of Leclerc right over to Liam Devlin wide open net makes no mistake about that goal Boy, he's a really important player to that top line since he has been healthy he has been playing some fantastic hockey this season Devlin missed a couple months when he blocked a shot with his hand he actually wound up with a broken finger as he whistled this offside the initial legend was that later in the shift with the broken finger unknowing that it was broken he blocked another shot with the same hand but he could not confirm that I think it's OK to keep that legend alive for UNH fans he said he tried to block another shot but uh, I think he said Marty Lavin's got in the way bring grit like that now with high-end skill guys and underclassmen with Silent Clear and Ryan Kami on that top line and you can definitely put those three in a conversation with the elites across Hockey East and that's saying something especially this year there's Kirk Silcons behind the net tried the wrap around and it caroms all the way out to Morgan Winters the glide ahead with Kristoff Scrastens Winters given a lane and he's gone to coast and Morgan Winters makes it a three nothing lead. We talked about it earlier in this game. UNH is a fantastic team seizing momentum and here it is two nights in a row two goals in the first two minutes of the second period for UNH. Nobody picked him up. No he, he, that's a little bit of that is, is his skill and his speed, but a little bit of that is also the team. You've got to find a way to, to gap a little bit better there. Anticipate the play. That's the, probably the frustration for Norm Bay's in right now. Continues a huge sophomore year for Morgan Winters as Fitzgerald drives the net but had to give it up. Winters played 20 games last year. He's a little banged up sometimes as a freshman, just in and out of the lineup, which happens to a lot of guys. But now a 22-point sophomore season. That was goal number 10. And Mike Souza just raves about his versatility. They've used him at center. They put him at wing. And it's another great development story for this UNH program. And Winter is a great second-line winger now. Yeah, he said he loves to please. You know, and, and, <laughs> and that, that was it led me to call him a golden retriever because that's what I hear people talk about uh, with that with that breed of dog. But you know, it's it, he just at this point. In his career, you can just see his confidence grow every single game. And to make a move like that, to know that you have the edge, you have a little bit of speed, and then you can make that shot and finish. And that's exactly what Mike Sousa is looking for. Big hit there thrown by Adam Cardona, who turns and says a thing or two to Nick Ring. Trying to get his Riverhawks fired up, throws another check that time on Cronin. Afferelli and Cronin in Sardarian. Shifted out to Alex Gagney, Wildcat captain. Shoots from the circle, pad save, Pavison, and he does, does just cover up. And he'll get the whistle with 17.27 to go in the second. This seems more and more familiar for what we saw yesterday, including him getting tangled up after the whistle. It's, I mean, certainly right now, UNH, it's, it's everything toward the net. They're getting pucks from every angle. They're moving, they get bodies to the net. I mean, this is, Kind of the coach's dream for what you're looking for in terms of 
a final week of the season what you want out of your team heading into the postseason if you're going to make a postseason run you have to play with a lot of confidence and right now this UNH team has it. And you know it is difficult they came off two losses last weekend to number one Boston College now that's something that a lot of teams can say they have this year two losses to BC but yes. They played really well and didn't have anything to show for it. And that, I know, was a, a level of frustration for, for Mike Sousa, his club. So to come out this week and really just from the start of this weekend have your foot on the gas pedal, that is a great sign for this Wildcat team. The UNH simply does not lose back-to-back -back games very often. Including yesterday, they're 11-3 after a loss this season. They lost two in a row to Vermont and UConn, but that was in separate weekends. They lost to BC and Merrimack in a split series. So that uh, sweep at the hands of BC the first time. They've uh, gone pointless in a weekend matchup against the same team. Trying to return the favor against UMass Lowell here this weekend, and they're certainly on their way. Icing called on UMass Lowell. Just three minutes gone by in period two. The Wildcats, I mean, they're making a statement, Jim. If we do get this matchup. Wildcats fans have to feel really good about maybe a third showdown, except for the fact that the old cliche, it's just so hard to beat the same team three consecutive times. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a cliche. I get it. Um, maybe some overused. Some coaches love to use it. Some love to overuse it, as you just mentioned. <laughs> you know, and that's, you're going to probably hear that from Mike Souza a couple of times this week. Oh, it's really hard. But he, he needs to make sure that if this game kind of holds this pattern and, and Lowell struggles and, and you know, UNH wins a, a lopsided decision. You've got to convince your team that it's not going to be easy next week. Big hit there at center ice. Yeah, Linder is slow to get up. Stick went flying. The uh, athletic trainer for UNH. And then Reifenstahl coming out. To help Linder off the ice. Veteran trainer, one of the longest standing in this league. He's been around Ooh. as long as I have. That's you know, I think he just catches a stick. It looked like kind of in the throat area. It's an inadvertent type of play. He's holding his jaw right now. So I'm kind of go down. The stick was there. He hits the ice kind of hard. So it's one that's just gonna sting a little bit. Yeah, nothing intentional there for out. No, certainly not. It's just an awkward play. You're falling in one of those strange types of plays. It was a bar work stick that came up on him. Only seven shots for UMass Lowell. They need more in a hurry. Darrell did well to avoid what looked like a tough spot. That one goes off the side of the net. Johnson checked by Lavins. Came back to him on the pass from Bentley. Now they couldn't connect, and now it's Reed to scamper behind the net. Almost gave it up. If not for the help of Jakob Helsted, who covered that. Three more goal scorers tonight for UNH. Sardarian, Devlin, and Winters. Yesterday was Conby, Caparelli, and then two from Blaisdell. And secondary scoring they've been looking for all year. I think they're starting to find it this week. Yeah, it's, it's amazing when a team does not have to depend on just one line. And that's what... I think that's one of the biggest areas this team has improved. I think that and limiting number of shots. And, you know, when you look at, at last year's team, which had a great second half and was trending in the right direction when the season ended, you look at last year's team, then compare it to this, I think that's where the biggest changes have come. There's more scoring depth, and I think the defense has done a fantastic job of just limiting opportunities. Stella shakes off the hit from Jensen. The glass. Becker kept it in initially, but now Sardarians brings a three on one. He's got Ring and Caffarelli. There's Ring and a club save from Luke Pavisic. Throwing on again. Pavisic got a piece of that one. Fourth line breakout. They put these three guys anywhere on the line sheet the way they look this week. Skipped over the top off the end boards. Caffarelli couldn't collect. Stays with it though. Cagney is there on the pinch. And now Becker will slide it out. Numbers for the Riverhawks now. Stella ahead with Owens and Cole. Stella with a shot. Lances wide of the right pad of Helston. Tried to pick that far corner. Just wide of the post. Clears the puck straight out. Stella had the overtime game winner here last season in January. Came all the way through the blue paint. And 
Now it's Peterson into a crowd. It's still cons. Backhander wouldn't go. And available for J.P. Turner. Will bank went ahead to Sardarian. Inadvertent pass to Collins. And he can work his way to the blue line. A backhander slides it all the way to the corner. Turner hops to the pocket, rolled off of me and stick, gets to the middle with Cronin. Turner holding and a big save from Pavisic. He will get the whistle. And as he turned his back to the net, 14.47 ago. I mean, this is more end-to-end -end hockey than we've seen in the first four periods in this series. Yeah, certainly, you know, Lowell with some good looks at one end, but then a little bit of a bobble there by Mean in the neutral zone. Nice job there, Pavisic, to make sure he's out and trying to take away some angle. The shot put really into the breadbasket there on the big goaltender. Mian comes back to the bench shaking his head. He could hold the blue line there. Uncharacteristic for the lone NHL draft pick, the Kings prospect on this Riverhawk roster. Warwick giving some room, he'll speed his way in, holding, and he's tripped up behind the net and keep it moving though. And Helston came off his line. Schweiger all the way down toward the corner. corner. Rasa with far work. Double team gave it up, and there's some room for Cronin. A little bit more room created in UMass Bowl's offensive end. They had to work hard for every inch last night. Seward will whack that one forward. Blaisdell and Cronin work it ahead. Cronin on the dump in for a line change. Yeah, you can see Lowell's actually trying to get, it looks like they're trying to get a little bit more aggressive with the four check. Now, the one thing you have to think about with that is one pass sometimes can beat you. The next thing it's off to the races for UNA. So you're gonna, you're gonna make sure that that defenseman is really aware where things are headed. Conby shot was blocked. And it winds up in the second row. It was a counterattack goal from Ryan Conby last night that really turned the tide. At that point yesterday, it was 3 nothing, And here again, it's a 3 nothing at UNH lead. Looking for a sweep of Lowell to finish off the regular season. Well, Mike Souza and there to the right, Jeff Giuliano. What a job they've done this season. It could be a 19-win campaign for UNH. And you know how badly Mike Souza wants to get this program back to where it was when he was lacing them up. A couple of frozen four runs. He had the overtime forcing goal in 1999 in the national championship. And it feels like they're right on the cusp of getting back into those conversations. Yeah, well, I still remember that game. One of the most entertaining championship games I've seen in, in quite some time. Obviously, last year was pretty good, too, with, with uh, Quinnipiac in Minnesota. But... When you play Maine in UNH, imagine playing your absolute arch rival for a national title and going to overtime. Costello, the cut to the middle, didn't get the shot off. Owen still pursuing the puck. And eventually, Reed cleared it around. Seven minutes gone by here in the second period. Bouncing puck ahead. A good setup from Conby to Devlin, but he's caught by Schweiger from behind. Top line for Uday Dick can really come out of nowhere on it. Good job by Schweiger to turn him away. Collins had his shot neutralized by Gagney, and Elston will wisely cover up. Yeah, it's simple puck support for this top line. They always seem to have the option for where they're going to make that pass because you've got you, a, a they read each other really well, but they support the puck. It's not, it doesn't always have to be a really long pass. Some of these simple touch passes or three-foot passes, and next thing you know, you get an odd man opportunity heading up ice. It was that weekend sweep against Maine here last month. Again, the uh, top rivalry next to or tied with BUBC in hockey, East, if not the entire country. They won both games, and the top line produced 12 points across the two nights. Lavins dangles inside, saved by Pavisic, and Johnson retreats behind the net. I guess the second line's pretty good, too. Marty oh. Levins, Morgan Winters just, just scored a highlight real goal, and Kristaps Grastens. I, I've, I've loved watching Levins play this year. You know, as he's gotten a little bit more accustomed to playing over here, he's so smooth. This one comes right to Winters, looking for number two, and the backhander denied by Pavison. It's the physical element that Levins brings. Seems to work well with the Winters and Grastens, who have the, the speed to go with it. Again, good passing here. One pass doesn't seem to work. 
goes past Craston's. Next thing you know, it's going over to Winters, and he's in great scoring position. That's just that's right now that that's just the way this UNH team is rolling. They are they're finding the opportunities as shots on goal in this game now. 19-9 in favor of the Wildcats. Abasich eyes on the back of his head to grab that one. The uh, American flag adorned the helmet. They played the uh, Canadian national anthem, the Beast of the East Band uh, UNH. Was able to blare that one out before the game tonight. That was a nice touch. You don't usually see that. Senior night. Usually try to honor. I was over at Boston College uh, on Sunday. They played the Swedish national anthem over there as well. Any good? Re toe tap? A little long, but <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Love the international flavor, of course, with the game of hockey, and especially the last. Uh, well, it's always been that way in, in Hockey East, but a lot of folks excited about some top Canadian prospects maybe for the first time starting to come to the college ranks. And Macklin Celebrini from Vancouver, the projected top pick in next year's NHL draft. The, the headliner in that conversation, the real Hobie Baker candidate for Boston University. It's Cardona, 11 and a half left in the second period. Still some time for UMass Lowell as Ray Young is unable to drag it through Hewitt. A.P. Turner has earned some playing time. Going well in practice. Laysdale reaching for that, but it hit the goaltend. Somebody sticks split in half. It's for the Svensons, and a tight angle shot wouldn't go from Cronin. That one stayed in play, apparently, and it goes to the corner. Nine minutes into the second. Fitzgerald with the keep in. Shot from distance, and Papasic is there to make the save. And he gets the whistle. And that was Philip Fortis Svensson's stick that was broken thus he's trying to do as much as he could look at him trying to block this shot not screen his goaltender but maybe get some block it in the corner he had a situation where if he had a stick it's probably an easy clear but tries to use his his skates as much as he can but UNH holds it in and tough game when you do not have a stick in your hand I will tell you that especially in the defensive zone it's a part of the required equipment a nice thank you seniors sign and always the creative insignias they put together there in the uh, UNH student section. My favorite I think is always that there's a team like uh, the Terriers. The sign says your mascot is domesticated. <laughs> Next to the Wildcats of course who always uh, seem to roam free apparently. Gerald couldn't find it neither could Owens. Plays Dell. Thrown in all the way across. Nobody home though. Almost came over to Reed, but he wisely backs up as Meehan was pressured. Good job by Cooper to win that race and confirm the icing call. 10 20 left in the second. At this point, yesterday was 4 0 UNH. And uh, you appreciate the renewed effort from UMass Lowell, but the answers in terms of goal scoring, they're just not happening for them right now against Jakob Helston and a, a UNH team that allows fewer shots than all the three teams in the country. Yeah, that seems to be going down every single game they play. Every, every opponent of late, they've been holding them below their average, which is just incredible. Yeah, they held the Boston College about 10 shots below their average in both games last weekend. Only allowed 21 yesterday, and Jakob Helston stopped all of them. That one off the side of the net. Peterson reaching, but it's Conby with the puck. Goes off the wall to Liam Devlin. That's perfectly placed. Devlin to the circle, took a bump, charges the net. That one nearly stuck its way home, but the net came loose and they blow it dead. And Cooper and Devlin get tangled up. The, the rule, of course, is just because you have the puck doesn't mean you can pummel the goaltender, but uh, Cooper might have been escorting him into the goal mouth that time. Well, Ryan Conby, uh, that's a high-level pass to free Devlin up. He's got one already. 3-0 UNH.
Welcome back to the Whittemore Center. Now, last night we got the chance to catch up with Wildcat forward Harrison Blaisdell, who told us it was the first multi-goal game of his career. Two for the senior. He was going for the third, but just fell short. But he said, I owe both of those goals to my line mates. They were great passes from them, but I'll take them where I can get them. And Coach Souza talked about the vet to us post-game, saying he does so much for our team. And, Jim, you touched on this earlier, but it can be five on five, killing penalties. He's worked his way onto the power play, too, but he competes so hard plays the right way and the game rewards him for that so nice to see him going into the postseason with that recognition and I'm sure confidence and Natalie he's got one of the most improved goal scoring seasons in the country from one last year his first year transferring from North Dakota to a 10 goal season in year two here in Durham again we talk about it. we talk a little bit about confidence and Certainly is what UNH is playing. We we uh, have a video review now. We're told for a potential major penalty. It was the the face mask in front. It's the actual feed, I believe, that the referees are looking at. It's, it's in this tangle entanglement here. And it would be Mark Cooper for the Riverhawks, who has the hand in the face area. It's hard to tell from that angle if he's really face masking him, like trying to grip, grip and hold the face mask. Again, De Devlin yeah. was the one with that late cross check penalty in front of the benches yesterday, so maybe some carry over there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually wondering, I don't know if we were told who, who's actually challenging. This could be Lowell that is challenging because it does look like. If anyone, it's probably on Devlin, right? Yeah, the face, the hand is certainly up in the face mask of Cooper, so this one could. It has to be a five minute major, can't be a two minute minor. Wow, there it is. And a five minute major has been called. So Liam Devlin, goal scorer in this game, he will get five minutes. He's going to sit in the box, so it does not sound like he has a game misconduct tagged along with it. And if there's uh, any momentum swing UMass Lowell has been hoping for, well, they just got it. They're going to get a five minute all you can eat power play trailing three nothing at the midway point in regulation. And yeah, they've got to, they need something to find some confidence. And we, we talked about it with the UNH power play. It's very similar with Lowell. They've got to get through the layers, get your shots through, have bodies in front of the net, trying to bang home rebounds. Doesn't have to be pretty on power plays. We know that. A five minute major for face masking. No game misconduct, though, on Liam Devlin. The great weekend he's having. Equally painful for UNH just not to have him on the ice for five minutes here in the second half of the second period. It's ben Meehan waiting for his teammates to tag up and he'll throw it back to Isaac Johnson. It's Meehan, Johnson, Stella, Forna Svensson, and Bentley. Top power play unit for Norm Bazin's team. Conmi Gagney. Jensen and LeClaire for the penalty killers. And a clearance there from Jensen. It's like Lowell is trying to trying to force things a little bit here. Try, you, know, you're, you're, you know going into the zone is one of the most difficult things. You try to do it with some speed. But if you don't have it, you can't just start throwing it into bodies. You've got to get pucks deep and chase. Human nature is, okay, we got five minutes. Let's tie this game with three goals. Yeah, you got to start with one. They've played now four and a half periods this weekend, and the Jakob Helston's turned him away with every shot on goal they've had. Weiger tried to go rink wide, and he willed a cold despite the tip from Lavins. The timer from Kraza hammered it wide. Our scout Truman. Got it back from bar work. Lost the edge after his one-timer. His fly. His pull off the wall to Barwick. Sets up cross in the corner. Barwick again down low. Looking for Cole all the way across, but a couple of Wildcat sticks got in there and a nice clearance from Morgan Winter. I liked what Lowell does there. They, they, they took the puck to the net. Did they connect? No, but that's what you have to do. You've got to be a little bit more aggressive with this, this uh, man advantage unit. Eight minutes to go in the second period. This time it's Helston with the clearance. And if Scraskin can get to that puck, they might have had a two on one. Plays Dell, one of the best penalty killers in the conference, fired that shot wide, short handed. Well, he 
Boom up the left wing. Takes it around for Peterson, and he lost the handle. Here comes Krastens and Blaisdell again. Krastens had the shot blocked by a diving Cooper. And Blaisdell retrieves it. Outnumbered, of course, on the penalty kill. It's back to Gagne at center, and he'll hammer it in. At the very least, Lowell wants to even the shot deficit. It's 21 to 9 UNH as this five minute major penalty continues. Face masking in a scrum after the whistle on Liam Devlin. Three minutes in, still no shots on goal for the Riverhawks on this power play. Gagne couldn't break out. Good pressure from Port Vincent, but now we got it free to Leclerc. Two on two shorthanded. Leclerc and Turner. He's forced back to the blue line by Mean and he's more than content to get it back to Gagne. Gagne throws a check on Port Vincent. Slides it ahead to Turner, whips one toward goal, and a blocker saved by Pavison. At this point, for Lowe, you hope it's not a deflating five minute power play. And check it up. Yeah, it certainly can swing the momentum the other way if, if UNH gets a kill. And back to bar work, nowhere to go. Slides it over to Ben Meehan. Bentley down low. Me and rips one toward goal. Popped wide. Johnson pitching it. Swept it on the back hit and a save from Helston. Winters finds some room. It'll carry it ahead with Marty Lavins. Me and racing back defensively. Saved by Pavisic. And they want him to keep it moving, so he does. Now Truman. It's through everybody. Scout Truman. One more dangle. Maybe one too many. And Gagney bumped him off the puck. I mean, penalty killing wise, UNH has not been shy trying to attack the other way. They've had three good rushes up ice where they've maybe not gotten every shot that they want, but they're creating some havoc at the other end of the ice. And certainly killing a lot of power play time. Four for four last night, and they're 20 seconds away from a five minute penalty kill. Alex Peterson. Nice feed to Collins, center for Silkon, but Elston will cover up. That's credited as a shot. That will be the first shot on goal in this five minute major. As we look at that end of the two on one there for UNH. Not even sure they're going to credit that as a shot, so Lowell still almost five minutes here in the power play without a single shot. They go with. Rayom, Bentley, Cardona, Fortis Benson, and Engum. Always feel good about Bentley on the dot. He's seven of nine. Eight of ten now after that one. Rayom with a one-timer. Plays Dell. Cardona with a kick down low and is back to full strength. A five-minute penalty kill and a great one for UNH to hang on to this three-nothing lead. It's by four icing. You know, there was a lot of penalty killing in Storage, Connecticut today. I think in the women's championship game, Northeastern had to kill off about seven straight minutes it was. of power play time. But that leads us to a big time congratulations. The Yukon Huskies women's hockey team, they hoist the championship trophy for the first time in program history. The Britannia Trophy, well deserved for the regular season and postseason champion. Yeah, Chris McKenzie and his staff, good friend of mine. Former assistant here at UMass Lowell, he's he's done a great job with that program. I remember the uh, the groundbreaking of the new arena. I asked him, "Is this big for you?" He said, "It's everything." Of course, it was the women's team who christened the Toscano Family Ice Forum, playing in the first ever game there, and they bring home the first hardware. Congrats to the Huskies here in Durham. It's three nothing UNH. successful five minute major penalty or the power play didn't go their way they can still if they can find a way to get three points in this game jump up to the 10 seed and avoid a third straight matchup with the UNH team that seems to have their number in it. although they also need Merrimack to lose to Boston College and right now the Warriors on home ice Scott Borick squad always fighting it's two to two right now against the number one team in the country we talked a little bit before the game I've, I've said that that is one building and I'm going back 
two decades. That has always been a tough place for Boston College to play. And I'm sure somebody will point out, oh, they've had, they had a big winning streak there at one point. But listen, I can think of some of the incredible games where, where Merrimack was a heavy underdog. BC comes in and uh, the Warriors could earn the win. Owen Cole shot off the toe drag and Helson is there. Worth mentioning that Boston College is pretty much locked into it. At least the top seed in a regional in the NCAAs. And they're starting a young Corrigan net, maybe a, a period or two off for Jacob Fowler, maybe a night off. So eh, just something to keep in mind. But you would love to see uh, with all the ups and downs that Merrimack has gone through, if, if they can find a way to a win on home ice against number one BC, that would be a well deserved positive finish to their regular season. It gives you a lot of confidence heading into the postseason, certainly. But yes, you're, you're pretty much right. I, I, it's hard to do all the math, but it's really hard to see any team. Uh, wow. Well, you get there. Yeah. There's going to be a, a penalty here yeah. on UNH. Caffarelli on Truman. Of course, UMass will take an exception to that. And there was already a successful challenge for North Bay's end in the face masking call on Devlin. If they want to think about something here, but the referees are discussing it. They're going to go they they want to go in and look at this from just the first quick replay. It looked like the original point of contact starts lower starts in the chest. I don't think this is a head. This is head contact, but uh, the more angles you get, the slower you make it. Sometimes you see things that we are not. So they are right now looking to see if this should be a five minute major penalty which that, that would be back to back five minute majors for you and H here and right now the, the concern is with Scout Truman he is uh, still down and being checked on by the training staff his not only is the contact strong oh it may, that, now see I, as I said you get some different angles and now I watch that one and I say that shoulder kind of might the, the first point of contact might have been the head First point of contact had maybe the main point of contact, upper chest, upper torso, but yeah, that, that shoulder might have clipped the head first. Yeah, Scout Truman has not moved. That, this is a scary situation. He, now, now he is beginning to get toward his knees. This is one of the more talented underclassmen in Hockey East. Plays exactly the brand of hockey that Norm Bazin asks his guys to play, and that's much easier said than done. So Caffarelli is off for at least two minutes. And Truman gives everybody a sigh of relief by getting back to his skates and he'll be helped off the ice. Uh, wishing him the very best. And he's heading right to the locker room. His line mate Jack Fowerwork over there helping him with the athletic trainer. Taking a long look here. And Again, you got a couple of angles, but still tough to make a definitive ruling, at least from our vantage point. And you just, your heart goes out to UMass Lola. Just the story of their season. They're finally as healthy as they've been in a while, and now one of their very best players, uh, his availability is in question. Yeah, the way that neck snaps back right there, it looks like that is one of the, those quick contact toward the face mask and then the follow through. That does a lot of damage right there. Those are the types, types of hits I think you're trying to take out. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this a, a five minute major, which, listen, if you're Mike Souza, you're sitting on the bench saying, guys, get it together. We can't take two five minute majors back to back here. Kill, you know, you, you did a great job killing penalty, the first penalty, but you don't want to do this again. And it's a Riverhawk team looking for any kind of spark. And well, there's no better way to do it than getting another five minute power play. But not this time. Just a two minute minor there and I think your initial read was what the officials eventually went with you. There was maybe a little contact in the head but primarily it would seem. It, you know the, the first look we got the original look it looked like the, the, it started at the chest. The injury might might be as much from the head hitting the ice when he gets when he goes yeah. down. And you hope Truman's all right. It was, a scary few moments. So they call indirect contact to the head is the final call. Indirect contact to the head. They show the replay on the, the video board here. A 
gas pulling up from the crowd down below us. All the best for Scott Truman. The Riverhawks look to rally without him on the power play once again. Peterson and Gagne battle in the corner. Convy gets buried, and that's a penalty. That's interference. Becker's going off. And he throws a right arm shiver at Alex Gagne. And not just for the rest of this game, but maybe for Wednesday's playoff match. They've got to get this uh, physicality under control. And the, the tolerance is down to zero right now for the official. You, you do have to get, get both, both benches, both coaches have to be thinking about this. Not just so tonight doesn't turn into a melee. You don't want to be without players in the playoffs. Yep. I mean, that's the last thing you want to begin the first round of the Hockey East playoffs with the suspension. So four on four for a minute 36. Maybe one of those nights you're happy that the benches are on the opposite sides to the ice here at the Woodmore Center. They're right next to each other in Lowell at the Songa Center. T.J. Schweigert who spins behind the net. Liam Devlin pressures him. Almost took it off him, but Schweigert, who Thor Bazin calls their most improved player this year, will get it to Farwork. Limner, nice footwork to work it free from Stella. Fulton Heward now. Take it to the middle, surrounded by a river hawk. It around Schweigert setting up Devlin back to the net turns and shoots but it's blocked by Schweiger Heward inside Morgan Winters into the four on four action now Devlin straight on shot off of Heward rebound saved by Pavisic on winter shot we've seen both nights that the four on four play has certainly seemed to favor UNH. They like the open ice. Of course, this used to be a much more open ice at what they called Lake Whittemore before they shrunk it a bit during last season. I mean, look at the corners and where the ice used to be. You realize how big this rink used to be. Sardarian had a good setup, but no finish that time. He scored the first goal in this game, but came on the power play. Reed along the blue line. Sardarian again with one toward goal. And now it starts a brief 20 second power play for UNH as Caffarelli's back on. Playfield tags up. Caffarelli bumped down by Johnson. And there's room for Mia. Final 92 seconds of the second period. One nothing UNH after 20. Scored twice more here in period two, and they killed off a five minute major penalty. Agni goes airborne, that'll stay in high off the glass. Cardona got whacked by Caffarelli. That's just a bit behind Cross, who did well to get a stick on it, though, and he can chase it down to the corner. Steps away from Gagne, slides it around. It is Jensen. Rasa shouldered off the puck by Gagne. Sardarian lost it. Got back though in front of Rayo. Jensen reaching. Owens down deep. As Cooper dropped it back to Rayo. Saved by Helston, reaching for a rare rebound. And now Crossa behind. That one's airborne back out to Cooper. Top of the circle. Shot hit his skate. That was Cronin, who kicked it up and out of play. 36 seconds left. 3 0 UNH lead. I'll give you a stat here. Ooh. Since the five minute major in this game, where Lowell had a five minute man advantage, the shots right now are 6 2 in favor of UNH. It just feels like the Riverhawks need to see a puck go in the net once it's against Jakob Helston. Very true. And things could change, but right now it's. it's Hard to see it happening the way UNH has been able to dominate no matter how many skaters they have on the ice. Heward finds a way out. Gets one ahead on the backhand to Lavins. Lager took it off him. 
Baston spinning at center. And Lavin will slide it around. Engham back to get it. 20 seconds to go in the second period. Baston's from a long way. Ten seconds left. On the top for Silcom. Nowhere to go, and he upends Linder at the end of it. Tripping call with 1.4 left in the second period. And a rough weekend continues for UMass Lowell. They're about to head back to the penalty kill. And they're also about to have their fifth scoreless period of the weekend. So cans. Pounds, I'm sorry, with the right leg out. Looks like that right there takes the skate out. So with 1.4 seconds, this will most likely be a power play that really is mostly on clean, fresh ice in the second period. Unless you and age can get one of those miracle quick shots off off this opening phase off. Ryan Condi is ready to let one fly. And he does, but a save from Pavisic. Miracles happen, Jim. The UNH will settle for a 3 0 lead and plenty of power play time left. The frustration continues to build for UMass Lowell as Sardarian and Heward were tied up with Stella and Meehan after the whistle in between the circles and the Lowell end. Yeah, this is, you can see veteran linesmen Bob Bernard and Robert Griffin out there. They are trying to get in, in between anything. Uh, rough stuff that is happening after whistles right now. We'll see what happens in the third and what happens in North Andover between Merrimack and BC, but 20 minutes away from a third straight UNH UMass Law game in Wednesday's first round. Let's send it down to Natalie Nori and Morgan Winter. Morgan, you went coast to coast on your goal. Now, your coach has told us one of your biggest and strongest assets is you can really skate. How do you think that sets you apart? Uh, yeah, I think uh, just going in every game. I think I stick to that. that. That's what makes me a good player I think so whenever my feet are moving uh, It's gonna be a good night and kind of like that just get a couple crossovers and the D uh, Making them transition. It's kind of hard to keep up Okay, great and here it seems like a little bit of a repeat This was the second period second game in a row two goals scored in the first two minutes What do you think is the catalyst behind these strong second periods? Uh, the message in the room has just been starting strong every period uh, Kind of punching first is what uh, coach has been telling us to do so I think we're doing a very good job at that. We still got third period, so hopefully we can come out there and do it again. Yeah, you can tell that message has been received. But Morgan, 20 minutes to go here. What kind of composure do you really want to see from your team here in the final 20? Uh, just a mature group, being smart, staying out of the box, staying out of the extra crap after the whistle, and uh, let's kind of take us to a win here. All right, Morgan. Thanks so much. Good luck. Thank you. Well, that uh, that last goal might be uh, tough to live up to the physicality we've seen after the whistle all weekend long. But Morgan Winters, a 10-goal season as a sophomore, up to 22 points for the season, a major breakout year, not just for Morgan Winters, but for the number 18 UNH Wildcats. They're in control once again, and they're 20 minutes away from a weekend sweep. Six minutes away from puck drop in period three. It is three nothing at UNH. Let's take a look at some highlights as the Wildcats doubled and then tripled the lead in the middle frame. And, you know, it, it's again just a quick, quick start to the period. We talked about this top line, just how well they su support the puck. And you see Conmy trying to move it to the slot to Leclerc. It doesn't get on his stick, but who's sitting right there, Johnny, on the spot? Liam Devlin. So that, you know, you're. you're that puck support has been fantastic, and then just a lot of speed here by Morgan Winters, just a player we, we we talked about a little bit last night and then tonight to snap that goal home. Mike Souza loves how much he has improved as a healthy player this season. And then we get into what could have been an interesting situation here. You get a, a little bit of a scrum in front of the net, and Liam Devlin gets a five minute major after a video review for face watching and Lowell's power play, they only ended up with one shot on net in that five minute power play right here. A puck that was put on by Johnson, Cole unable to find the rebound. But that, that was almost a turning point in the period because if Lowell pops one or even better pops two, you, you start moving. 
since that five minute major though, they, they start they began it with nine shots on goal, they finished the period with eleven, so it was not a, another period where the UNH defense has been ultra stingy in what they're giving up for shot totals. And yes, the Wildcats will start the third period on the power play. The first goal of this game was a power play goal from Steven Sardarian. For the weekend, they're one out of eight, but we've had some good looking five on four time from last night and tonight. We'll drop the puck for period three when we come back. UNH 20 minutes away from a weekend sweep and all the momentum they need heading into Wednesday's first round playoff game. Heading to period three with Jim Connolly. I'm Tyler Murray. Before puck drop, let's send it down to Natalie Norrie. Thank you, Tyler. It was UNH associate head coach Glenn Stewart that caught up with us that intermission. And he said, yeah, we've had strong starts to our periods. We're sticking to the game plan. He said, we had some really great chances on our penalty kill there, but we need to stay out of the box. He said, it seems like the game is being called pretty tight right now. So keeping that in mind, we just have to stay disciplined, be careful. And heading into the final 20 here, maintain that maturity, stick to the standard of playing, and just keep their foot on the gas pedal. Now to touch on Scout Truman on the Riverhawks side, who took a big hit there in the second period. When we last checked in during the period he wasn't in the locker room or the trainer's room right away he was just in the hallway on a knee he had his helmet off and just seemed like he was trying to compose himself just gather himself after that we're unsure of his return at this point we'll keep an eye on it thank you Natalie yeah, it was a high hit but ruled incidental contact after a replay review on a heavy check from Nick Caffarelli so and just a, a simple positive sign of having Truman able to work his way off the ice with some help. Now, entering this weekend, UNH had an outside chance at a first round bye and a five seed. They needed six different things to happen. That includes, let's say they hang on to this 3 nothing lead. Five of the six things wound up happening, Jim Connolly. UMass had to go up to Maine and pick up zero points. That just is uh, confirmed. Maine won both games in regulation, surprisingly. And impressively, late goals in the third period for the Black Bears. So a great finish to the regular season for Ben Barr. I mean, that's, they're going to wind up being the best regular season in Orono in a couple of decades. So huge congratulations to that program and that fan base. They needed Providence to lose to BU. That happened. They needed to win both of these games here. And if they can hang on, of course, uh, that'll happen. And the one that scenario that went against them, was Providence beating Northeastern today. It took a shootout to do it, but had Northeastern won that game on the road in regulation, then UNH should be about 19 minutes away from a first round bye, so it almost went their way, but in the end, they'll be playing for some momentum, and it could be a 19-win season as they look ahead to perhaps a first round matchup with this very Riverhawk team on Wednesday. And they get to treat their fans to another home game here in the postseason. They would not have been had a home game at all if they finished the five seed. They would have played on the road. Uh, get the bye, but play on the road. That's a great point. They haven't had a, a home playoff game since 2015. These fans really deserve it. They swept UConn in, in what was back then a three-game first round series. A single elimination, all 11 teams get in. Sardarian couldn't connect on that one timer. The diving pass back out there by Devlin, but it's cleared by Peterson. Look at the playoff games the last few years for UNH as they continue to operate on the power play. Sardarian left alone and he scores! Second power play goal of the night for Steven Sardarian. And it's all. again here's a player you love having some confidence in as you head into the postseason nice move there doesn't get the the big roof of the of the shot but plenty to get it just inside the post there past Luke Pavisic and a four nothing lead to be back to back nights where this is our score here in the third period and Sardarian what a player to get a little bit more confidence and we talked about depth I mean, right now at least the way we list things or that things are listed on the UNH line chart. He's the fourth line. So, I mean, if your fourth line wing is putting up a couple of goals, uh, you have to feel pretty good about the depth on this hockey team. 
entered the night with just one power play goal all season. So now he's got three for the year. Ryan Conby still leads the team with five. If you've watched you the last few weekends on the power play, and no surprise to the breaking out of the uh, what was an 0 for 18 slump with two power play scores tonight. Cardona sets up behind the net, but look at how battle tested Mike Souza and his teams have been in the last few years of the postseason. So many close losses, and all of them on the road as Collins just rifled that one by. Last year they went to Providence, lost two to one in overtime on a Jenge, Jamie Engelberg game winner at Schneider Arena. Christoph Skrastis is forced down by Collins. Two years before that, they went to BC, took an overtime loss, four to three on a Mark McLaughlin game winning goal. With the uh, overtime forced by three Tyler Ward goals. He had uh, a historic hat trick in the postseason for you. Three years ago, they beat Maine on the road with no fans in the first round. Then it was that game at Boston College with cardboard fans. They're down 3 0. After the first five minutes, Alex Newhook and company were running away with it, but then they scored two quick ones in the second period, and it felt like they were going to come back and win that game. So maybe this is the year in front of these dedicated fans here on Wednesday. Can they pick up a, a well deserved playoff win and get back to the quarterfinal? Hey, you know, I mean, we don't do much rooting here, trust me. Uh, but I trust you. The one thing that you loved back in the 1990s and parts of the 2000s with Dickie Millie was how great of a fan base UNH could have when they got to the Boston Garden and the Fleet Center, the TD Garden, whatever you want to call these buildings. But it was fantastic the turnout the team would have. And Maine's no different, but right. to have one of these teams back there would be unbelievable. Now, as it is right now, unless things aren't probably going to actually they can't change. These two teams would not get to the garden together because I think if my math was done right, they would have to meet in a quarterfinal game as the three versus six. Yes, exactly. You'd be looking at a three versus six, but it's a good reminder. Those tickets are going especially fast this year for the semifinals of championship at TD Garden March 22nd and 23rd. So hop on it while you can. You see a shot here from Ben Meehan. And you can imagine as we get closer and we find out exactly what those matchups are. I mean, if you get a projected maybe BUBC championship game, and that's going to be an even hotter ticket. So uh, we would recommend that getting them while you can before those matchups are settled. That went high from Nick Rayo. Numbers the other way for UNH. Liam Devlin has a goal already. Dishes to LeClaire, and he's caught from behind by Cardona as he tried to set up. Now LeClaire steals it. Devlin waiting in the middle, but he couldn't get it to him. Cooper breaks out clean. These moments have been hard to come by for UMass Lowell. The neutral zone has been clogged by New Hampshire. It's usually the Riverhawks who were doing that to their opponents. Conme gave it away. Cooper couldn't cleanly work it toward goal. LeClaire got a stick in there. And a lot of that is because of the leads that UNH has been able to open in these two games. When you're chasing, you've got to be a little bit more aggressive. You can't sit back and, you know, just let the play come to you and play your great defense, which Lowell is well known for. You've got to start attacking. And UNH, they've been able to get be more of a defensive posture, particularly for the third period last night to begin here tonight. Nifty clear from Jakob Helston. I don't see this a lot, Jim. Icing on the goaltender. We saw a hand pass on the goaltender yesterday. So Jakob Helston's racking up the infractions between the pipes. He's racking up the, the zeros in the goal column period after period. That's the most impressive stat of the weekend. Let's not forget that five full periods in a row. And don't, don't forget, he, he only gave up one goal against Boston College last Sunday, a one nothing loss to the Eagles. One timer from Johnson, and there's Helston once again. I'm sure he's got those highlight saves, but it's the consistency and the positioning that really impresses you about a guy who came over from North Dakota this year. He, he, you know, that's when you when you're a coach that's what you want in a goaltender confidence and when you see a, a goaltender that's out by the top of the blue paint on a shot that's coming in from deep and you, you know that he is he knows where he wants to be he's confident he knows if he'll see the shot he'll stop it and that's 
where we have come with Jakob Helston this season. Gerald gets to this one first, pressured by Collins, though. He went down to a knee about five minutes into the third period. Mian unable to handle that at the blue line, but fended off Scraston. Fitzgerald all the way to the end boards. Kavistich touched that one behind the net. Johnson threads one through to Collins. Kind of snagged the stick of Scraston. I'll say so far, the first four plus minutes. Five plus minutes of period three. UNH doing well, not getting involved in the fisticuffs that led to that five minute major. The reviewed check on Caporelli could have been called a five minute major, but they kept it the minor. Owens lifted it high. Any way to avoid giving UMass Lowell any kind of motivation for a team that you know, they just want to put one in the back of the net right now is probably going to serve UNH well on Wednesday. Hit there from Cooper on Sardari and Caffarelli on the other end had a good look at it, but a save from Pavison. You see these counterattacks by UNH. They, they're obviously worried about making sure defense is the, is the priority here. Have four guys back every time, but they're coming up ice and they get some some space. They could really snap some really challenging shots off for a goaltender. In the last few opposing coaches we've talked to with a game plan for UNH, that's what they talk about. Saying the Wildcats don't beat themselves. We have to make sure we're ready to track them down on counterattacks as Harward took a heavy hit and just getting back to his skates now. 13.40 to go in period three. It is all UNH right now as they check on Harward. to break after a big hit on Jack Varwork and we come out of the break with a video review. Of course Varwork was slow to get up and we've already seen Scout Truman had to leave the game after a, a hit up high and the Riverhawks have challenged this for another hit to the head. That one is certainly first point of contact at the head. Now the, it is difficult as Varwork was kind of heading down as he gets hit. It's a difficult play as the attacking player, the player that's delivering the hit. And, and it's Caffarelli who is the subject of the Truman review. These two referees, Bobby Esposito, Pete Slickenhart, they spent a good amount of time in this replay box tonight. Right from uh, the first Let's say five minutes when Steven Sardarian banged one off the post. They were checking that for a goal or no goal. Hit to the head, five minute major. I didn't see a, a game misconduct tossed, uh, toss hand signal. And well, when you when you have a player lowering his head and then taking a hit, sometimes you can do major no game misconduct. Yes, and that I think is what we have here. Yeah, he'll. He will go into the penalty box here. And just as we were saying, nice job keeping it within the buoys for right. UNA trying to manage this game and right. not giving any motivation to Lowell. And, and, and I, you know, I, I don't aim to think too much like a ref, but I have to wonder going in there looking at the same player for head, potential head contact for the second time in the game, how much that maybe you know, influences their decision. Well, they were able to kill off a face masking major five minute power of play with the Liam Devlin major penalty last period. And did not give up a shot. Stick save there from Helston. Bentley on the other end. UMass Lowell finds some kind of momentum. It'll bring it around to Bentley. And you can see, still top, hard four checking here. <laughs> we mentioned that the last time we were in a five minute power play that UNH is aggressive. Still blocking shots. Colton Heward that time. Right toward the middle, pushed out to Johnson. One timer from Bentley fanned on it, stays with it though, and that one fired wide. They got a piece of the woodwork on the way in. Pull to the circle. 
Barwork spins one back. Meehan, stick shattered on him, dives at the puck, and that prevents the breakout. But let's see, that could be a hand pass. Yeah, it is. Barwork didn't want to touch it because that confirmed the call. But you love the effort from Ben Meehan, the UMass Lowell captain. That's probably a breakaway shorthanded if it doesn't make that hand. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, in a weekend that a lot has gone low, wrong for Lowell, I mean, that is another one of them. Uh, just a shattered, exploding stick as Meehan is trying to take some sort of a one-timer here. Actually, he was just really trying to make a quick pass across, and his stick broke above the blade. Agni over the top toward Turner off the back of his skates though. So here's Cole. Akrasa didn't get the shot on. Slides to the blue line. Varwork backhands it to the circle. Akrasa reaching. Gagne could not clear. Schweigert from distance. Pad save Helston. And it's powered out by Turner on target there to Pavisic. A lot of interesting results around the league this weekend. The headline is probably main sweeping UMass as Varwork fanned on that one. Rayom couldn't follow it up. And with a pointless weekend for UMass, who was in the field of 16 and then on the bubble and then maybe outside the bubble, depending on what else happens around uh, college hockey. They were hoping for something of a better result up in Orno in terms of uh, their chances at an at-large bid. Yeah, that is probably what has hurt the most. Obviously, you'd love to host a, a playoff game, and there'll be that number five seed that doesn't get to host uh, in the quarterfinal round. But the, the pairwise is probably the most important thing right now, I think, to uh, any of the coaches that are in the in the mix for the NCAA bid. Yeah, they have to go to Providence for the quarterfinals on Saturday. It's the only quarterfinal matchup we know so far. BC, BU, and Maine will wait for Wednesday's first round matchups to see who they're going to face. You know, the three seed Maine will host the best remaining seed from the first round games. And the highest seed, 6 through 11, it's locked in. It will be UNH. So if the Wildcats win here on Wednesday, Against either UMass Lowell or Merrimack, but right now it looks like it's going to be against UMass Lowell for the first and second game. And they can win that and set up a quarterfinal matchup at the Alphon UNH Main. Great, great rivalry series in a, a potential quarterfinal round right there. That is, that is, uh, you know, I know BCBU is one we think about a lot of the barely even met in the playoffs. That is a fantastic potential matchup. Porta Svensson skids it to Johnson, whacked one toward goal, but a big block from Lavins. Mean couldn't get the one timer on, and the captains go to the wall as Gagne dives in. Now Porta Svensson behind the net, hoping to center, but he got Lavins instead. Mean from the circle, saved by Helston. He's pushed down. Play continues. Pile up behind the net. Over halfway through the period, and with just one minute left in the second five minute power play for Lowell. They generated a few shots this time, but still nothing in the goal column. Jensen now. Johnson down behind the play. That's over the glass with 45 seconds left. Officially, Lowell has been credited with two shots on goal in this power play. I, I feel like a. a, a I'm not trying to criticize anybody that's a great stat taker. I feel like a couple of times with these power plays, the start, the number's not going up for Lowell, but I feel like I've seen a couple of shots get through and a couple yeah. more shots than have been credited. Yeah, 15 saves on 15 shots for Jakob Helston. Now, let's say unofficially so far, but he's got them all out no matter how many they've put on. Owen Cole blasted it wide. Half a minute left in the long power play. Varwork shot. That one's blocked by Heward down low. The force of that shot took him down off his skates. He's limping heading to the bench. Well, not heading to the bench. Going to have to stay out there as the puck goes right back in the zone. Collision in the corner. Varwork and Reed. Rayom out to Schweigert. Cross on now. They've got a piece of Helston. Popped right back through. 
but out of play first. And that's going to be an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty right there. I believe that's far work. Yeah, tapped it in after the tapped, whistle. He can't do that. He can't tap a puck in. And in a game where we've already seen emotions get a little bit high, referees aren't going to put up with that at all. So far work, who is coming off a great weekend. Those two big goals on Saturday and the overtime loss at UMass. He'll come off here and that will kill off the second five minute power play that goes goalless or low. If you don't know what we're talking about, that's exactly what he did. He cannot shoot a puck onto the net, even if it's just a little bit of a tap like that, after the whistle is blown. So four on four for eight seconds. And and another UNH power play. They've got two power play goals tonight, both from Steven Sardari in the Sabres third round pick. And there may be 10 minute misconduct tacked onto that as uh, we saw another Riverhawk player head over to the box. That was Jack Collins. So he might be serving the minor well. Uh, 10 minute misconduct is also served by Barwork. Peterson at center. Out of the box, Sardarian, or uh, Caffarelli rather, and Sardarian comes on to replace him. So you got five on four. Devlin got rocked by Angam. Schweiger could not clear. Leclerc feeds Hewitt. Shot saved by Pavisic. Angam couldn't find a way out. Stolen by Devlin. He and Sardarian communicating, and Devlin will take it. Leclerc walking in. Heward toward the middle. That got a piece of Peterson, who was down on the ice, and an easy clearance for Zilka. Heward slinks his way in. Stopped by me in, but no clearance at one off one of his teammates. Clear out high, right on that blue line, kept it in. Down for Hewitt, battling with me in now. Johnson comes in to help. Sardarian reaching for it. He's on hat trick watch, of course. Cole swiped at it. And ahead to the Wildcat line. A lot of similarities to last night, including four goal lead built by UNH and the methodical management and a sizable lead late in the game. In no hurry. That's some room for the player, though. And Sardarian was set up for the one timer. But Stella saw that the whole way. Sardarian to the circle now. Johnson sticks with him. At the Conby, final ticks of the power play. And it's Fitzgerald going for a spin. Setting up Leclerc. Power play is over. Possession continues. Collins back to the ice. Conby's shot canceled out by Johnson. And with 6.42, we'll step aside. 4 nothing UNH. Draining the clock here on a Saturday night at the Wit. Welcome back to the Whittemore Center. Wildcat head coach Mike Souza talked to us about this time of year this past week, saying now is when you reflect on all the ups and downs through the season. He said, but for me, it is all about this time of year. It's the most fun. It's when you want to play. He said the playoff time of year, you come out of the rink. It's warmer outside. It's a little bit lighter. Now, don't forget, we do turn those clocks back tonight. But he also said you can smell playoffs are in the air. He said, personally, as a player, I loved it. And as a coach to play in all these games this time of year, it's a lot of fun, too. And it's a whole new season that starts on Wednesday. So it'll be fun for us to be a part of, too. Thank you, Natalie. Now, I, I, I do want to confirm. I always get it wrong. It's fall back, spring ahead, Jimmy? That's correct. So what uh, do I do tonight? What, what's the plan? Move your clock one hour ahead. I know. Do so I lose sleep? I don't like ever correcting my good friend, Natalie Nori. She said back, you got to go ahead. You're, oh, okay. losing, you're losing sleep tonight. So I would have missed all my appointments by two hours next week if you hadn't just said that. Okay, good. <laughs> Great stuff as always, though, from Natalie Norrie. Great insight from Mike Souza. He knows what it takes to win this time of year on the ice and on the bench. And UMass Lowell had challenged for another potential five-minute major, but with relative swiftness, they determined that there was no major penalty. I mean, if you're Norm Bay's in, you might as well keep challenging. He's got two right already tonight. So. That's the truth. <laughs> 
And that is the rule. If you keep getting them right, you keep having the opportunity to challenge without losing your timeout. And Gretzky, Gretzky penalty. That's right. Delay of game if you get a long second time. That is something I'm hearing that there's a lot of talk to possibly change that next year to uh, not have that timeout loss being part of it. If you get it wrong, you immediately would uh, get a, a, a penalty. We have some something going on behind the play. They let him play. Yeah, there was a big hit. Blaisdell didn't like it, so he returned the physicality. And I believe Schweiger. Yep. Cronin will drag it ahead against Cardona. Blaisdell is on the receiving end of some hitting. Gerald as well that time. I'll keep everybody upright. We had a, a couple of scary moments with both Scout Truman and Jack Barwork slow to get up. Barwork stayed in the game. Truman did not. Look at Cam Gendron on senior day. Stay Patterson. Rebound is stopped. Kept off the goal line by Cardona. Fantastic play there by Cardona. A defensive play. Now we have a wildcat down behind the play. That's Gendron who just had that great chance. He scored a goal earlier this year at UConn. That's his one and only tally this year. The bench went nuts. They, they love Cam Gendron out of Hampstead, New Hampshire. Really nice breakout here. Better save from Pavisic as we hit the final 5-15 tonight. Wildcat fans feeling good. They'll be here very early on Wednesday trying to get those best seats in the student section for the first home playoff game on this campus since 2015 when the Wildcats swept the Huskies of Connecticut. They like everybody across Hockey East in this uh, three-year-old playoff format. Two wins away from a trip to TD Gardens for the semifinal. And all other games are now final. Boston College a 6-4 winner over Merrimack, a four-goal third period for the Eagles to come back. They were down 2-0 and 3-2 in that game. Guess who says you can't flip the switch? If you're as good as Boston College, I guess you can. Five minutes left in this one. It's been quite a 40th regular season in the history of Hockey East. As Cole connects with Collins, high slot shot handled by Helston. Got uh, one of the first unanimous national number ones we've seen in years in Boston College. All those first rounders. They're the only team standing in their arch rivals' way for a hockey East to maybe even uh, return to the Frozen Four. They went toe to toe with BU, swept them in a home and home that eventually decided the hockey East regular season. Here's Caffarelli. Slides one through. Sartarian looking for number three, but not this time. Sardarian's been everywhere on the ice tonight. What a fantastic game he has had. And we're going to get a penalty here, a slashing call on the River Hawks. Owen Cole's heading up. And for Sardarian, every athlete talks about how underrated confidence is, but Sardarian's a guy who, you know, English is a second language, came over from Russia, and man, he has just grown up in so many ways. And it's helped his team to another apparent win tonight. Yeah, you know, and. I know Mike Susan has talked about that. It's just sometimes it's just the comfort level. You come yep. in here and you know English is not your first language. You're coming over from Russia. Uh, you've got, you've got the academic side obviously is probably the more difficult part than the hockey side for most players. But if you don't feel comfortable right away, that can affect your hockey. Well, you can tell as this season has gone on that Sardarian is really getting comfortable. Abisic able to squeeze that one initially. A pop free. So another power play for UNH. Fewer Devlin, Sardarian, Conby, and LeClaire. They like this group. It's led to a nice special teams day. I mean, the, the penalty to go probably been more impressive than the power play that's seen two goals from Sardarian. Here he is again, but that one hopped off the stick. Nice job by Devlin to handle that pass that was behind him. Heward right in front, Devlin across to Conme, but that goes into the gear of Pavison. Now the interesting question, too. You obviously, you had four goals against last night for Henry Welsh. Oh, you beat me to it. Four goals again tonight for 
Luke Pavisic, who's your goaltender when we get to Wednesday in a single elimination playoff game? I call dibs on asking you. <laughs> who, who, who do you think is going to be the goaltender, Henry Wilson, Luke Pavisic on Wednesday? I, just because of the amount of hockey he has seen down the stretch, I feel like Welsh will be the choice, but I've never been good at reading Norm Bazin's mind when it comes to that. And you've known him since you were 18. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can remember my first year on Lowell Radio back in 2013-14 season. Who could forget? Lowell was going to a third game in the quarterfinals against Vermont. They ended up winning the Hockey East Championship and being a game away from the Frozen Four. And legend Bob Ellis, who's actually calling his last regular season game for the Riverhawks tonight sure. after 40 years. Yes. Bob Ellis and I sat there before the game wondering if maybe Norm wasn't going to start Connor Hellebuck. <laughs> What? <laughs> Just was one of those mo moments. And, you know, a few weeks later, I know that Lowell won the, the championship. They were a game short of the Frozen Four. And a few weeks later, you know, Hellebuck wins the first ever Mike Richter Award. <laughs> so, well deserved, too. Very much so. But, you know, sometimes you just get in your head, what's the decision going to be? I think this might be easier than you think. I thought we'd see Welsh today. Centering feed and a nice save from Pavisic just as we're hyping up his counterpart on the bench right now. And Sardarian, or rather uh, Scratchton's that time, is denied. Three seconds away from the UMass low penalty kill. And what do you think in terms of team mentality? Usually after a tough weekend, you have to sit on it for five days. And they get right back on the horse on Wednesday. Right. They have to come right back here and play the same team that just uh, swept them, barring a miracle. That can't be fun, but not a whole lot of time to dwell on the disappointment of this weekend. But the other thing that goes with it. Veteran feed for Crone and a good block from Crossing. With that, too, though, Tyler, is the fact that Coaches love to talk about how the playoffs are the time to hit the reset button. Yeah. Everybody's back to zero and zero. Boy, this might be the ultimate weekend to try to find that reset button if you're low. Because they, they know that they're a better team than, than has shown up here over the two nights. They were playing some incredible hockey. They had points in five of their last seven games coming into this weekend. Right. And, and you know, three one-goal losses in a row to nationally ranked teams. And, you know, two against Amherst and one against uh, Providence. So they knew that they were playing good hockey. It just it hasn't shown through this weekend. So that reset button might be the the biggest, uh, the most critical part of the coaching that Norm Bazin is going to do over the next three days. Well, we've talked a lot about those two overtime losses to UMass, but they had leads in both of those games. It was UMass who scored the game tying goal on Saturday. Grastons will throw it across to Morgan Winter. Sardarian's behind him. Trying to set him up for a hat trick opportunity. Heward. Lindner winding up. Heward keeps it himself. And Pavisuch reaches out to grab it with 38 seconds left. Silcons and Winters have a late news check. Now it's 38 seconds of just keeping your heads on. Stay composed. Like we, we mentioned before, you do not want to do anything that would get you suspended for the first round of the playoffs. The 6 and 11 seeds, and it'll stay that way. Third straight matchup coming up on Wednesday. Linder into Sardarian. Couldn't settle it in the slot. Pushed off the puck by Becker. Here comes Collins. And they break through here with just 20 seconds left. They'd love to get one, but they're offside with 18.4 to go. 18 saves for Jakob Helston of UNH. He had 21 last night. Yeah, I know I mentioned this earlier. I guarantee you, one of the first things that Mike um, Mike Souza will say when he walks into that locker room tonight is, "Enjoy it, boys." They need to hit a reset button too, because yes. as we said, he will he will message it for the next three days. It's hard to beat a team three times in a row. It's hard to beat a team three times in a row. Well, 
he's going to have to get that message across to his players to make sure that they come ready to play on Wednesday at Wednesday night. Offside again. 11.2 to go. I can already envision him downplaying this weekend to Natalie Norrie in our postgame interview. I, I can too. Yeah, I and I'm sure he'll say that he's proud of these guys. He'll talk about his seniors, but he'll also be happy to to say there's a lot of work still to do. Everybody goes back to zero and zero. You do hope he takes a moment, and you know he will, to admire what a special season it's been. They're about to get their 13th home win of the year and a hungry fan base. Oh, their bellies were full this regular season. It's a weekend sweep for UNH. 4 nothing on both nights. They're red hot heading into the playoffs. And it's going to be a fiery atmosphere on the ice and in the stands when these two get together on Wednesday for the first round. A little bit more. I, I, I want to give a, a real credit to this officiating crew to oh, yeah. getting in between as many times. And, you know, Bobby Bernard has been around this game forever as a linesman and having Robert Griffin with him tonight they did a good job of separating everything and the handshake line here really quick good games see you Wednesdays is what you hope and there's not a whole lot of playoff history between these two teams not really much of a rivalry. It's obviously intense in hockey's play, but maybe something brewing here. But there is no question this weekend belonged to UNH and Jakob Helston, who gets back to back shutouts, 21 stops last night, and unofficially 18 saves to turn the Riverhawks away all weekend long. And of course, a lot of coaches feeling good about their goaltending this time of year, but. No one's feeling better than Mike Souza after what he's seen from Jakob Helston lately. Yeah, one goal against in the last nine periods of hockey. That is really solid. And as you mentioned, that includes uh, Boston College last Sunday. Well, Mike Souza standing by with Natalie North. Coach, a strong weekend for your team. How much validation was it to get this sweep heading into the postseason? I don't know about validation. It's just about put, trying to play well at the right time, and that's um, that was our focus. And uh, you know, we made some plays tonight and, and uh, got good goaltending again. In terms of special teams, they saw a lot of ice time tonight. How did you like the way they took care of both sides of that? Yeah, I think we had two power play goals. We killed two five-minute majors off. You know, we put ourselves in a tough spot taking majors. You know, and but our penalty kill came through for us tonight. But on to a new season, so. That's right, Coach. Quick turnaround on Wednesday. You see the River Hawks again. What message will you give to the team to make sure they're ready to play here on Wednesday? Norm's one of the best coaches in college hockey. He'll have his team ready to go. Okay, Coach. Thanks for your time. Good luck. Thanks. Good stuff there, Natalie. And no argument here. No argument anywhere. Norm bays in. If there are buttons to be pushed, he's going to push them to get this team ready for what needs to be a bounce back on Wednesday. An excellent postseason coach. We know that. Three hockey's championships in the span of five years, not long ago for UMass Lowell. Their journey to the top of the mountain and UNH's begins here on Wednesday night. Thanks so much for tuning in to the 40th season of Hockey East on Nesson. Getting started.